Hey guys, welcome to another Home Assistant video. While designing and building this house, I wanted an underfloor heating system which could heat and cool per room. That doesn't sound like rocket science nowadays, but over the past few years, it might as well have been. Although technically, with a bit of research, I could design most of the technical systems that needed to go into the house, that research, or rather time, turned out to be a finite component. So I had to make a choice and I decided, okay, I know the most about networking and lighting with my Quinn LED boards, etc. So I'm just going to buy an off the shelf system and hire someone to install my heating and cooling, etc. control. So I don't have to spend any time on that. Oh, how wrong I was. Welcome to my battle of two and a half years with the Honeywell Evo Home System. Now, immediately I have to nuance that a little bit. I believe that the Evo Home System can work okay if you have a really simple setup. In my case though, I have lots of rooms, I have an external heat pump, and I want to be able to cool and heat per room. Well, if you want those things in a logical way that it should work, buckle up because you're in for days, if not weeks of reprogramming and hanging on the phone and even getting people from Honeywell themselves over here, which in the end told me I needed two thermostats per room to make it work. And then I told them, but they're exactly the same model number. And they said, yeah, well, we need an input for heating and cooling differently. And I'm like, so the software on your base station is too stupid to be able to do it with one. And they were like, ah, you might see that differently than we do. And I'm like, I'm not going to put two thermostats in a single room, which cost 30, 40 euros a piece for no apparent reason. So I've been reprogramming, resetting, and actually rewiring the whole system every season change, because I, if I have to change from heating to cooling, I have to do everything again. And it's just utter crap. And as I said, if you have a really simple system and you just want to heat a few rooms and you have a normal furnace, I'm sure it can work okay. But if you have anything more complex, please avoid. Can't make it any more clear than that. Anyway, enough about that. Those are my reasons. And basically what this video is a start off is that I'm going to work towards basically replacing that system with a self-built Demotica system, like I did for my lighting, which turned out great. So, store bought, I don't know. The first part of that system would be to get a temperature of all the rooms in the house and feeding that to a central location. After looking around and building some breadboard prototypes with DHT sensors and other types, that wasn't really it. Sensors are often inaccurate or need to be calibrated and making it all battery powered was an even bigger hassle. So I looked around what was available and I came across these Xiaomi Maija temperature and humidity sensors. These sensors are about 10 to $12 a piece. They're battery powered. They come factory calibrated for the temperature and humidity sensor, and they should last about a year on the battery. To boot, they have a nice display. You can't input a temperature with that, but that's what we have smartphones for today. And in theory, the system should regulate itself anyway. So as I mentioned, these little temperature sensors and humidity should run for about a year, and it does so on a single AAA battery. And best thing yet, it even reports its battery level, so you know when it's getting low. But there was a problem with these, and that is that they don't have Wi-Fi on board. There's no ESP on there, and they're actually based on a Bluetooth connection to like your phone or a central hub. Well, that sucks this thing would have been ideal. Well, not anymore. Using an ESP32, which has Bluetooth on board, and ESP Home, you can basically create a Bluetooth to Home Assistant bridge to get the sensor data from these devices and put it into Home Assistant. Could that actually work reliably? 
Well, to test it, I bought six of these guys, and I've been testing that for the past two months. And in the beginning, there were some issues, ESP Home, or rather the underlying code that ESP Home was using from upstream wasn't particularly stable yet. But over the past few months, there have been a lot of updates, and for the last two, three weeks, it's been perfectly stable. And I've actually had up to six connected to a single ESP32, and that's worked fine. So I decided maybe it's time to share this with you guys. And if you're looking to measure temperature and or humidity per room in your house, this might actually be a very good choice. So take a look in the description because I will have links down there to buy the correct type because they have other types which do not use Bluetooth. And uh, let's configure some together. All text fields like configurations and stuff like that will also be available in a blog post linked in the description. So make sure to check that out. First, we're going to go into ESP Home in HASIO or Home Assistant. If you don't have ESP Home installed yet, this tutorial doesn't cover that, but it's pretty easy and you should be able to find that online. Once you're there, click to create a new configuration and it doesn't really matter what you fill in there, only the name is important. The rest of the configuration details we're going to copy from my blog post. Okay, once that configuration is created, open it up to edit it and paste in the scanning configuration from the blog post. Then change the name to the name you just gave the file also and change your wireless uh, ID, password and API password to whatever you're using for your installation. We don't need to change anything else. So then we're going to click build so it will compile the firmware and we can download it to our desktop to which I have connected my ESP32 module so we can flash it from there. Okay, while it's building that, let's uh, plug in our ESP32 module. This is a MHET Live ESP32 that I like to use. And as always, I'll have some links in the description for that. After the compiling is complete, you should be able to push the download binary file and download it to your desktop. On your desktop, we're going to use a tool called ESP Home Flasher. This tool is specifically made to do the first flash using USB to one of these ESP32 modules. And after that, you don't really need it anymore because you can flash it over OTA or over the air. It's a very nice technology and I wish we had that years ago. Once you open up the program, select the correct COM port. Once you have the correct port, hit the browse button to select the binary file we just downloaded. And then it's basically just hitting the flash ESP button and it should start erasing the flash on the module and uploading the new code. Now, sometimes it won't do that because it can't put the module into flash mode all the time. There are two little buttons on this module. One is called EN and the other is called boot. Hold down the boot button while it's trying to flash and you should see it progress and then start flashing. At that time, you let go of the module and while well, I'm always afraid it's going to go wrong, I don't touch it anymore until it's done. Once it's done flashing, you can keep it connected to your USB port so you can see the serial logging. But since it's now connected to your Wi-Fi network, we don't need the USB connection anymore and we can also do that from the ESP Home web interface. Depending on your home network setup, that's going to work immediately. Or as I showed you in my previous video about these uh, energy monitoring plugs, I set up a static DHCP lease to which I set a DNS name and then I can find the module. If you'd like to know more about that, check out that video in the description. Now, when this is all done, instead of having this ESP module connected to your computer the whole time, you can use the built-in USB port to power it using a simple phone charger. That way, you can place enough modules all around the house to basically cover all of your rooms. Now, you won't need that many. The Bluetooth is based on 2.4 gigahertz, and that penetrates walls and stuff like that pretty well. In my case, I needed one in the attic on the and on the first floor, 
And on the bottom floor I need two, one in the central main living area and one in the garage. I've also tested, as I said, with up to six sensors and that worked fine. In my case, actually, I don't have to put any additional ESP32 modules in my house because I have a lot of Quinn LED boards around the house, which already have ESP32s, and they can happily share the function of the Bluetooth scanning and getting the data from the sensors, and also doing some LED dimming and having other sensors connected. So I can use one ESP32 and combine all these functions together. Okay, as I said, the ESP32 should now be connected to your network, and we can use the Show Logs button in the interface. After waiting a little bit, if you at least put a battery in this thing. You should see the temperature and humidity information pass by. Now the battery information isn't broadcast as often, but we only need the MAC address of each module you want to connect to this ESP32 to be able to connect it. If it doesn't show up, there is a little button on the back side, which will basically cause it to spam broadcast its address. And then you can copy and paste it to a notepad or something like that, because we're going to need that in the configuration we're going to do after this. So go back to the blog post and copy the second part of the configuration file. And there you see two sensors listed. And what you need to do is you need to change those MAC addresses to the names you found during the scanning. And you can also set the logical names per sensor. So that is the logical names that will identify itself to Home Assistant with. So you can set things like living room and bedroom, kitchen, garage room, wherever you're going to put the sensor. But as I said, these ESP32s are pretty powerful, so you could do lots of things with them with different sensors or switches or LED dimmers connected. So you don't have to use it just for having the temperature sensors connected. Okay, once that is done, upload that new configuration using OTA to the ESP32 module, and then we're ready to add this to Home Assistant. In Home Assistant, go to Settings and then Integrations. And once you scroll down a little bit, you should see ESP Home and then Add button. Add the ESP Home module using the name you used before and then enter .local and enter the API password if you set one. After that, wait a few seconds and hit refresh on your browser. And then it should be added in your integrations list and Home Assistant should have automatically detected the temperature humidity and battery values per module you listed in the configuration file. And well, that's it really for this video. You now see the temperature and humidity in Home Assistant and of multiple modules. And as it turns out, it's actually not that hard to add multi-room temperature sensing into Home Assistant. Now in the second part, we're going to look at battery life, what I've seen over the last two months. And we'll also look at creating some graphs in Home Assistant and also in Grafana for longer term statistics. As I started this video with, I intend to build this into a complete replacement for my current Evo home system. So that will control all my heating and cooling needs, but that's going to take a while. So make sure to stay subscribed for that. So if you liked this video and it was helpful to you, hit that like button. And if you have any questions, let me know down in the comments. If you'd like to have a longer discussion or have more questions, maybe join our Discord server. We're always up for a chat. And uh, yeah, thank you for watching and see you guys next time. Bye-bye.